Deep is the town. Superdome the stadium. And a sugar sweet game is in store. Penn State and Alabama nesting 1-2 atop the last regular season poll. Now Joe Paterno's Nittany Lions accorded that top spot by coaches and writers face to face with their toughest challenge. Bear Bryant's Crimson Tide may be runners up in the polls, but don't expect them to settle for it. After this matchup, they'll be cheering from only one side of the field, one bench. We're number one is the shout. When the game is over, only one side can claim it. So, scoreless first quarter. Bama forges a seven-zip lead at halftime. And with a 14-7 advantage in the final frame, the brilliant Chuck Fusina, who's been bottled up tight by Bama, tosses the tie maker to the end zone, only to have it gathered in by number 28, Don McNeil. A troublemaker for Penn State, that McNeil. Later, he brings down Scott Pitsky inside the one. Bad dreams for the Lions. Three tries fail. And now, still with goal to go, Bama's Barry Krause stops tailback Mike Gooman just short of the goal. This kind of miserly treatment makes Penn State strangers in Alabama territory. And it makes the Crimson Tide winners. When they carry Bear Bryant off the field shoulder high, there isn't an Alabama fan you or anybody could convince that Bama was anything but number one. Yet way across the country, there are a few ready to dispute that claim. The quiet emptiness of the big stadium in Pasadena soon is filled with expectant thousands and two powerhouses on the field. A scene of bliss on the sideline, University of Michigan cheerleaders, women posing with the Southern California men. And to the delight of the home state partisans, USC draws the first score as two finely honed grid machines go to work on the turf. Paul McDonald tosses to Hobie Brenner, showing how USC got to that enviable 11-1 season. There was more joy in Pasadena and a lot of post-game argument, too. Trojan Charles White, already the top ground gainer in Pac-10 history, dives over for a score. Or does he? Confusion is rampant at the goal line. Official overruling official. But rule it is. And USC goes to a 14-3 lead, 17-3 at halftime. In four years, four years of college play, Rick Leach has played every game for Michigan. Now he's fighting to get Michigan back in the game. He connects with Roosevelt Smith, who pads into pay dirt. USC's lead is whittled to seven points, but that's as close as Michigan can get. The Pac-10 power lock continues, and the Big Ten has managed only one Rose Bowl win in a decade. There was dispute, yes, but there was no revoking the points on the scoreboard. They read 17-10, favor of the Trojans. Good enough to give them a share of the top team title. They, too, had earned the right to say, we're number one. No look ahead to the season to come is complete without a look at the heroes of the year past. Oklahoma's Billy Sims. Sims will be back, one Heisman already in his pocket. The Sooners' six-foot, 205-pound halfback rushed for 1,762 yards in 11 games. This bruising speedster shredded the opposition and collected a mere 20 touchdowns, which comes down to nearly 11 points per game. When he gets the ball, what effect? I'm going to run like a crazy man, Sims is quoted. Not so crazy, he ran right off with a 78 Heisman. Another contender, Southern Cal's Charles White. A junior, he will be back to torment Trojan opponents. A real workhorse, White chalked up a monster 342 carries. 5'11", 183 pounds. But how he can move. Good for 1,760 yards. He'll be back moving, darting, scrambling. A gridiron Superman who can even fly. Slightly less known than the dynamic Sims White duo is Curtis Dickey, looking toward his senior year at Texas A&M. 
Dickey is an agile heavyweight, comes in at 205 pounds, stands 6'1". Dickey was there among the rushing leaders all season, and only the Cotton Bowl-bound Houston Cougars and Baylor managed to bottle him up. Still, he finished the season with nearly 115 yards per game, nine TDs, a total of 1,146 yards on 205 carries. Dickey, White, Sims, big guns on offense. College football has many diverting moments, but none so pleasing as the time spent watching the pretty girls. Stellar freshmen promise an exciting 79 college football season. At Ole Miss, the freshmen did proud. A rebuilding effort centered on John Forcade, and big things may be in store. Here is just a brief look at some other standout freshmen of 78. Talk Alabama football, and you spell it B-E-A-R, Bear. At quarterback, Bryant has Stedman Sheely ready to go. Jeff Rutledge will be sorely missed, but Sheely has shown the kind of ability that gets Bama conference titles and bowl bids. There is Steve Whitman, a bruising fullback who can head for the sideline or down the middle and chew up yardage. And Major Ogilvy. He saw his opportunity, and he took it on Sugar Monday. He'll be just a junior in 79 and heading for a star. Enough stars, and they make you a general. Preseason wisdom had Georgia in the Southeast cellar. So much for preseason wisdom. Coach Vince Dooley turned his Bulldogs around. They captured second place in the conference along with national rankings. Jeff Pyburn can throw and run. But good as he is, he's got a battle ahead for the starting quarterback slot. Dooley played a mess of freshmen and sophomores, figuring he had little to lose. One result is that Dooley can call on young veterans, despite tender years, scarred and ready. None more ready a kid than Buck Ballou. Here, a link up with Anthony Arnold for one of the scores that no doubt flabbergasted the opposition. Another Georgia biggie is likely to be Scott Warner. Warner is being compared these days to Jake Scott, the All-American defensive back of another day. Tough and talented as Alabama and Georgia may be, no marshmallows in the rest of the Southeast, as here we see.
country's wide open in Texas, they say, and college football sure proves it. The Southwest Conference claims four schools with Texas in their name, and all but Arkansas situate in the Lone Star State. The Longhorns missed another title, but with defensive giants like Johnny Johnson, watch out. This defensive back is an All-American, and he's back, back, back. He can plug up opposition runners and break their hearts with runbacks. Here's one that costs the enemy dearly. The Texas line is solid, and no part more solid than Steve McMichael. The Texas defense was one of the stingiest in the Southwest. Houston has got to be some kind of miracle team. Defense stars like Hosea Taylor, number 90, closing this one down. And linebacker David Hodge. Look for number 42 on an intercept. They will help make the Cougars a menace again in 79. There are uncertainties. Delrick Brown can toss and seems to have the inside track for the quarterback slot. But there'll be competition in the backfield, and that ought to be caution enough for Houston's opponents. Not a vintage year at Texas A&M, but this season, Mike Mosley returns as a junior. With a sweet 5-7-6 completion percentage, he's a threat always. And watch out, too, for SMU. Mike Ford, you don't do much better than Mike Ford, passed for 3,000-plus yards, the college leader. Here, he hits Emmanuel Tolbert, receiving one of his 11 touchdowns. Tolbert ranked third nationally in receiving, and he and Ford will both be back to make trouble for the other guys in the Southwest. Don't count out Arkansas under Lou Holtz. Don't count out anybody, in fact. The Southwest brand of football again promises to be H-O-T. A lot of schools, a lot of teams in the East. But in 78, Penn State towered overall. A narrow loss to Alabama in the Sugar Bowl after an undefeated season, the only blemish on the record. Penn State can count on continued tight defense, led by tackles Bruce Park and Matt Mellon. Linebacker Lance Mell is part of the mix, and he's an agile play reader. Then there's a guy, Harris. Pete's this one's name, related to a guy named Franco. And Pete Harris is not bad either. National intercept champ last year. Another golden team in the East is Pitt, coming off a neat 8-3 record and a national ranking. Just a junior, Rick Trocano is a savvy thrower and field general. He netted five touchdowns in season play, nearly 1,500 yards, with a near 500 completion percentage. Fred Jacobs is back, and he gives part of the punch to the backfield. And he doesn't have to carry the whole load, either. Another speedster with moves is Ray Rooster Jones. Though neither achieve top national statistics, their steady diet of rollouts and plunges keep the opposition on the edge and defensemen busy. Pitt is tough, but there's a number of bright football suns rising in the east.
Clemson and Maryland were the potent ones in the Atlantic Coast Conference. Clemson's new coach, Danny Ford, taking over just before the Gator Bowl, guided Clemson to a win over potent Ohio State. One thing he can count on in 79 is a solid defense. Number 83, Jim Stuckey, helped the Tigers to a fifth place ranking in scoring defense. Add in linebacker Bubba Brown, number 47, and a solid wall. A stalwart on the ACC scene, Maryland moves right along. Offensive stars are needed, but the Terrapins are one of those teams backed solidly with a solid defense. Defensive back Lloyd Burris helped hold six conference opponents to just 62 points. At end, Jimmy Schaefer, number 83. At the guard, Marlon Van Horn, number 62. He'll be back with tough, bruising play. And with him in the Terrapin mix, linebacker Brian Matera, number 53. Rebuilding is going on elsewhere in the ACC, and there could be some surprises along the Atlantic shore. They're playing songs both sad and happy in the Midwest. Bo Schembechler brought his Michigan crew to the Rose Bowl again after an outstanding season against tough Big Ten competition. Bo's biggies will not be back. The estimable Rick Leach in four years at quarterback played every game. Here he hits wing back Ralph Clayton for a nifty TD. Clayton nailed eight big ones. He should make life a bit easier for Leach's successor. An era ends. A new regime begins at Ohio State. The Columbus brand of football madness will be presided over by Earl Bruce, late of Iowa State. A remarkable group of freshmen is moving up in the Buckeye lineup. Arch Leister was in the hot seat from the beginning, leading the Ohio State youngsters to a respectable 6-2 conference mark. Schleister passed for more than 1,000 yards and added 500 yards and 11 TDs running. The Purdue powerhouse will be booming again, too. The field leader will be Mark Herman. Herman is 6'5", just a junior, though that seems inappropriate as a description. He was 20th in passing nationally with a dozen touchdowns and follows the great quarterback tradition that produced Bob Greasy and Mike Fitz. Flowers and sweets of all kinds will be the target of postseason dreams in the Big Ten. As usual, though, getting there will require walking a long, tough road. Right there in the middle of Big Ten country, but not part of it, is Notre Dame. You remember them from the Cotton Bowl. Zero on the clock. A one-point victory. To coach Dan Devine, that score was divine indeed. Vegas Ferguson. He wrote the rushing record for the Irish. 1,192 yards, 5.6 per carry, and more than 108 yards a game. Attention focuses on the major schools and their teams but superb records are compiled everywhere. Dave Wilson to tight end Ray Hinton for a score. That's how Ball State stayed on the ball against Western Michigan. Not that heroics were lacking on the other side. Western Michigan's Eric Manns picks off a Wilson pass, proving interception heroics are exciting no matter who you're rooting for. 
Ball State, incidentally, topped the full season scoring defense list, allowing an average of just seven and a half points a game. They run for pay dirt in the Big Eight, the year focused on the Nebraska-Oklahoma rivalry, and with good reason. The teams met twice, and next year, who knows? Billy Sims returns a senior and a Heisman, but here we see the defense is strong, too. John Goodman at defensive tackle. Then there's defensive back Darrell Ray, alert to a tip pass, good on the run back, and another top-notch Sooner stopper. This was the crew losing in November 17-14 to Nebraska, came to Miami and topped the Cornhuskers 31-24. Not to take anything from Nebraska, they went nine and two on the season, tied with the Sooners for the Big Eight title and beat them late in the year. There'll be strength returning for Nebraska. Wingback Kenny Brown helps make up for a needed quarterback. The team faces a major rebuilding and nowhere is more crucial than the spot behind the center. Another bright spot is I am hip, brilliant as a sophomore, seven scores last year on close to a thousand yards. He needs to concentrate on ball control to become an even greater headache to the opposition. Then there's Missouri, 7-4 in 78, but Coach Warren Powers and his boys like to knock off biggies like Notre Dame. Quarterback Phil Bradley led the Missourians to the Liberty Bowl. A dozen touchdowns and a sparkling 62% completion record. A strong finisher as the season wore on and back as a junior is number 32, running back James Wilder. Big eight, beware the giant killer. They were all bunched up in the Pac-10 standings, but the Trojan horse came up the winner by more than a nose. Coach John Robinson has 16 starters coming back. There's so much talent aboard this Trojan team, one hardly knows where to begin. White, all right. But Paul McDonald racked up 18 touchdowns and seems likely to improve in his senior year. He totaled nearly 1,700 yards, nearly nine yards for each attempt. He throws with especially devastating effect to flanker Kevin Williams. Against USC's share of the number one national ranking, UCLA, traditional crosstown rival, doesn't seem to have too much to cheer about. But let's look again. Quarterback Rick Bayshore is back for his senior year. Here, Tim Reitman takes in the pass, a demonstration of the kind of attack to overcome a potent USC in 79. With two top runners, the Otis Brown and James Owens gone, a major role seems in store for halfback Freeman McNeil. Perennial Pac-10 power Washington tied for runner-up slot in the year past, but as always, the Huskies can go for the roses. Tom Porras will be calling the signals in his senior year. He passed for six TDs and will be looking to better his 1,151-yard production. At tailback, Joe Steele back for his senior year. He was 25th in rushing nationally with five TDs, 1,111 yards. And with 21 of 23 frosh red-shirted, Washington's got to be counted in. Everybody's got Rose Fever. Among the constellation of stars in the West, you can't fail to mention Ed Luther of San Jose State, 
fourth-ranked quarterback in the nation. Luther racked up nearly 2,300 yards. Even at night, there is plenty of scoring sunshine in the far west. Also out west, where a man or a man, there is football talent of plenty ranging over the college gridiron. Quarterback Mark Wilson at Brigham Young is right at home with a wide open game. Another tosser is Jim McMahon, who may help the BYU fans overcome recent departures. San Diego State's Mark Halden nailed 14 TDs in a spectacular season. He ranked third nationally with 205 completions and 2,262 big yards. The backs out west don't want to be fenced in. The quarterbacks can scramble, but they'd rather let fly. Makes for another exciting season ahead. Fans turn out for college football, that's for sure. Attendance nationwide passed 34 million, and that's an all-time record. Millions more watch on TV and listen on radio. And not just the major teams. Divisions 1AA, 2 and 3 also had a surge in attendance. The college football fan seems to be telling the college football player, you're number one. And from the quality of play, they seem to be saying back to the fans, you're number one times two. <laughs> 